Okay, so uh, this is part two of um, what is now a six-part series, just because there were 75 lodges to uh, cover. Um, so now it's going to be a six-part series. So this is part two. In part one, we covered northern New England, which were three whole states and eight whole lodges. Today, we're going to cover southeast Massachusetts and Rhode Island, which is going to need to cover 15 lodges in the same amount of time. So I'm going to try to limit each slide to roughly one and a half to two minutes. And let's get going. So uh, I'm Roy Weatherby. I was the Blue Book Regional Editor for New England for the uh, first six printed volumes. I was the Astra Area, Asta Area VP before ISCA and was the Northeast Region VP for the first 10 years of ISCA. I was a past lodge advisor of Packachog Lodge 525 in central Massachusetts. That'll be coming up, I think, in four or five weeks. And I'm currently serving as the advancement chairman for my son's troop, Troop 114 Shrewsbury, Mass, with 91 registered boys. I've been collecting since 1977 when I first attended uh, a jamboree, which was actually CJ77. And my focus has been on collecting New England OA ever since Rob Cutts published his New England book in 1987. This is um, a presentation that was inspired by the North Carolina Showstopper presentation from last fall. I thought that was great. I learned a lot. I thought since so many showstoppers from my area are already well known to collectors, I wanted to add an educational twist and talk about some rare and obscure items that most people have probably never seen. So due to the large number of largest lodges to cover, um, 74 of them, I've divided it into six. This is part two, and we'll be covering Rhode Island and Southeast Massachusetts. And uh, I believe I'm on deck in three weeks, and we'll be talking about the Eastern and Northeastern part which is pretty amazing because we'll cover 17 lodges and it's all one lodge now. So New England OA, Southern New England, um, Southeast Massachusetts and Rhode Island have currently three active lodges. So Abaki Misanaki chartered in 1948. It hasn't been impacted by any mergers yet to date. We have Tantamos Lodge that was chartered just in 2018, very recently. And we have Tulpe Lodge, Lodge 102. Uh, the 102 was taken from the Rhode Island side of the merger. Tulpe, of course, is a name that goes way back to um, the 19, um, where are we? Uh, 1946. So um, Tantamos Lodge, chartered 2018, was formed by the merger of Chippenyonk 59 which in itself was formed by the merger of Muscatawquid 414 and Tonkakoo 487. And then the other part of that merger was Tusquantum Lodge 164, chartered in 1969. And it was formed by Manomet Lodge 164 and uh, Tusquantum Lodge 518, uh, chartered in 1939 and 1956, respectively. On the Tulpe side of the house, this was merged in 2015, chartered in 2016, Tulpe Lodge 245, uh, where the original name comes from, was chartered in 1946. And Abnaki Lodge 102, where the 102 comes from, uh, was formed by the merger of Nemat Lodge 124 and Winchek Lodge 534 uh, back in 2002. And then finally, Nemat Lodge 124 had been formed by the merger of Nokochoke 124 and Agawam 509, which were chartered in 1938 and 1954, respectively. So we're going to try to touch upon all of those lodges. Um, instead of doing a showstopper and a sleeper for every single lodge like I tried to do last time, I wanted to keep it slow. So we're just gonna blast through the showstoppers in the first few slides, and then we'll just focus on sleepers from there on out. So this part of uh, my area has two Wabaningo issues. Wab issues are almost always a showstopper. We have the Tulpe Lodge 245R1 on the left and the Abaki Misanaki Lodge 393X1 felt on the right. These are two um, patches that were pictured in the Wabaningo handbook uh, by Dwight Bischel in 1952. Um, a couple 
patches here that are not WAB issues, but perhaps could have been, um, are the Nokachoke 124R1 on the left and the R2 on the right. The R1, I consider probably the rarest and most valuable patch in my collection. On the other hand, the Nokochoke Lodge 124R2 is probably the most common classic felt in New England. So um, a bit of a contrast there. Other showstoppers from the area are the X1 felt from Agawam 509. Um, it was pictured in the first flaps book, but I don't consider it a flap. It was their lodge totem. And then on the right there is the Manomet Lodge 164, their first issue, the R1. And then of course, uh, a lot of people collect first flaps and we have quite a few showstoppers in the first flap category up here. I'd say the best one in the region is the Tonkaku 487 F1A with the white paddle, very thin white paddle handle there. Um, very difficult to find mint. Uh, this one in my collection currently is the one that Dave Thomas actually pictured in first flaps in color. Uh, the next most difficult first flap in this area would be the Tulpi F1, um, beautiful scroll work border. And uh, again, uh, very difficult to find. And then the other two aren't bad either. The Tisquantum 518 cut edge um, and the Muscatoquid 414 cut edge. Uh, the Muscatoquids were one per honor and it was a very tiny lodge, only three towns. So generally 414 issues were restricted and uh, very uh, limited due to the small size of the lodge. And then we have um, maybe another tier here. We have the Nokochoke Lodge 124. We have the Cape Cod uh, Council's Abaki Misanaki 393F1. We have the Manomet Lodge 164F1 with the arrow going the wrong way. Their F2 had the arrow corrected. And then finally, the Abnaki 102. Uh, they chartered in 2002, which isn't that long ago. Uh, they made 500 of this flap and yet, um, you cannot find it for under five or 600 bucks. They were one per person and um, are still uh, pretty hard to come by. So that's kind of uh, a sleeper and a showstopper at the same time. So we'll start with the, um, the easternmost lodge, Cape Cod Council. And we obviously looked at the, the F1 and the X1 showstoppers. This shows um, it's interesting that three out of the four jacket patches that the lodge has issued are, are showstoppers. Um, but I'll start with this um, scallop shelled patch to the far left there, uh, designed to be similar to their X1 and their X2 issues. This was a hat patch that was used um, for the 1992 NOAC and it's pretty scarce but you would look at it and you wouldn't know that. Um, they made uh, a limited number, I, I'm sure less than a dozen or so. It's not on a felt, it's on a muslin material. Uh, and it was actually made by the same um, local embroidery company that made their lodge shirts and jackets and such. So instead of embroidering it on a shirt, they took that muslin backing material, they tripled it up embroidered some patches and had them cut out. And then four of these were um, glued to hats uh, and given as gifts to the four adults who drove the contingent all the way out to NOAC that year. Uh, 92 would have been in Tennessee. So that's uh, a bit of a haul. And um, there were a few leftovers. Um, so like I said, this may be a dozen of these made, four of which were issued on hats. Um, the Grey Wolf Dance Team, this is their J1. And you know, one of the themes I'm finding as I go through all these um, patches and pulling out what I call the sleepers or the rare ones, the rare ones in these lodges tend to be limited by you know, either a subset of the lodge over here, like a chapter or a committee or a dance team or an Alangamat team or an executive board. And um, so this kind of falls into that category. 
This dates to the early 90s. And according to the dance team chairman, who uh, was responsible for the issue, and he was later lodge chief, there were 16 made. Um, I've seen a couple, and I've seen enough to know that they were made one at a time. So on, you know, what they would call a hand loom. And they're a little, each one is a little bit different. So handmade varieties exist, but uh, very, very scarce. And then the dance team members would have sewn these on the back of a black satin jacket. And they actually used a Canadian wolf patrol medallion, which had a black background and a gray wolf on it, on the fronts, on the breasts of these jackets. So it was a combination of this on the back and a uh, Wolf Patrol, Canadian Patrol med medallion on the front. Uh, and then finally, they're J2 and J3. These came out maybe, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago. And they had a red border and they had a red Mylar border with red Mylar details. And they issued the Mylar one as a fundraiser. And they only made 10. So that's going to be extremely difficult for anyone trying to complete this lodge. 10 made here, 16 made there, 12 made there. And I don't think they made more than 30 or 40 of the regular one too. Again, uh, Cape Cod and Islands is a pretty small council. It's a pretty small lodge. When they come to conclave and events, their contingent can be anywhere from four people to maybe maybe a dozen. Um, so small lodge and their stuff doesn't get out much. So moving west to uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, whaling capital of uh, New England, we have um, Agawam Lodge and we saw the Agawam felt whale earlier, but by far the hardest patch to find in this entire lodge is their 1966 uh, Lodge Fellowship patch. Um, I've, in 45 years of collecting, I've seen maybe three. Um, it took me a very long, long time to find it. Um, I was looking for another sleeper. This is the sleeper for 509, but there's also this plastic neckerchief slide that I've seen that I'm also, I'm looking for if anyone ever sees it again. So moving on to Fall River, the next uh, council, next lodge west, uh, Nokachoke Lodge 124, of course, has the killer R1 and has the uh, felt uh, R2. I call it felt. They're really com flocked composite materials with a canvas backing. Um, but again, after the R1, the absolute toughest patch from this lodge is their Fall Fellowship Conference, a Langamat patch. Uh, and again, I don't think I've seen more than three of these in my 45 years or so of collecting. So definitely a sleeper, definitely something to look for. And then Nemat Lodge. So Agawam and Noquichoke merged 1972 to form Nemat Lodge 124. And there are a lot of little issues. Uh, they had this spring into scouting event that ran for, I think, 11 or 12 years. And getting all 11 or 12 of those is um, killing me. I'm missing 95 and 96. So I put that in here. You wouldn't think much of it, but it's really, really hard to find. Um, one of the other tough issues from this lodge is their Alangamat service patch. Uh, again, only a Langamats could earn it. I believe they could only earn one. So these didn't get out much. The white border Nemat, they had black for ordeal, red for brotherhood, yellow for vigil, and white for lodge chiefs. So again, this was limited just to lodge chiefs. And so it's pretty hard to come by too. And then over here on the right, I just wanted to uh, call out there was, um, there was a certain weekend where the lodge was having an event and they had run out of patches and they had to do a rush order. And they did this rush order of patches. They came in with cut edges instead of rolled edges. They made 40 of the red border brotherhood and they made 40 of the yellow bordered uh, vigil. So, and they sold that in that one weekend. So 
these are pretty scarce just because it was available at one event only. And then um, I guess one of these sold for hundreds of dollars on eBay at some point and some company in Asia started knocking it off. So there is this fake out. So if you see a NEMAT yellow border cut edge, it could be the rare one or it could be this fake. And uh, one thing to look for here is the, um, the black lines that are in the piece pipe and those black outlines are not present in the fake. So just something to watch out for. So moving north, Manomet Lodge uh, around Plymouth, Plymouth Massachusetts um, has the R1, which was a gray border, but it also has a very rare white version, white background. And a tan variety is also rumored. I've seen a couple tan ones over the years, but I've never seen a mint one. So I don't trust the color. But if anyone ever sees like a mint condition tan manamit round, I'd be very interested. The, uh, the neckerchief on the far right there was just discovered a couple of years ago when a collection was donated to the museum at Camp Squanto. Um, this had never been seen before, but pretty obviously dates to uh, the same era as these rounds. So, and then moving on to Tisquantum Lodge 164, which had hundreds, hundreds of issues. And of all their hundreds of issues, I have to consider the J1 which was their NOAC jacket patch, uh, the hardest to get. When I was trying to complete this lodge, this was actually the very last patch that I needed to complete it. The NOAC flap was a trader. It was traded at the event in quantity. It's very common, but the jacket patch, and you get a sense here, the flap is an oversized flap, but the jacket patch is um, just a bit bigger. Uh, that's really a key to uh, completing this lodge. And so looking north a bit, because all, all these Southeast lodges kind of merged in the direction of north and west. So this is um, a bit further north, um, but we're looking at uh, Muscatawquid Lodge 414. It was chartered in the late 1940s. And um, this was their kind of council slash camp patch. And they earned these segments that would go around it, you know, these date to the late 40s. And you would have to look closely and you would have to know the lodge's totem, which is the flying squirrel. But there is this segment right here. It's below the musket with the brown flying squirrel. And that is actually their very first issued OA patch. It was a segment for um, this patch here on the left. And again, I've only seen a couple of these. This predates their S1 by at least five years and likely predates their R1 as well. So, you know, if you're ever looking at, you see Knobscott was their camp. You see Norenbega was the council. Anytime you're, um, you know, shuffling through, you know, a pile of segments, you know, which are often in people's junk boxes, um, this is one to look for. It's definitely a sleeper. And then the other things that are really, really hard to find, I've been chasing them for years, are Muscatawquid jacket patches. And they have many, so this was a three town council, three town lodge, pretty small, and they would order things in pretty small quantities. And so they have um, a number of, all in this shape, they have a number of different varieties. So there are red borders and some have the blue out, uh, the purple outline on the mountains. Some don't, some have 28 feathers, some have 36 feathers. Um, there are all these different varieties because they ordered um, so often in small quantities. Uh, the one that's pictured here is a blue border. Uh, it's one of the ones I need. I need a bunch of minor varieties of the red borders as well. All of these jacket patches from this lodge are sleepers. They're all very difficult, except for their later white border 
uh, jacket patches and purple border jacket patches. These date to the 80s and 90s and uh, were available in quantity. So the white borders, the purple borders, pretty common. But any of the red borders are scarce. There are many minor varieties. And then this blue border uh, is also scarce. So they merged with Tonkaku Lodge 487, which of course had the white paddle F1 flap that's so difficult to find and difficult to find in mint condition. Sleepers here are their dance team jacket patch uh, from roughly 1973. I'm told about 30 were made. Again, kind of a niche group, a uh, small subset of the lodge had these patches and um, you know, 1973, that's almost 50 years ago. So uh, that's definitely a sleeper. You don't see it very often. But here on the left is something that you might look at quickly and think it was a fake. It's computer designed. Um, it's got a gauze bag, a little made in either China or Taiwan sticker on the back there. Um, anyone that's familiar with this lodge and their flaps would look at that and they would think it was a fake. I got a phone call from Roy Moore one time. He collected uh, vigil flaps and he got one of these in and immediately contacted me to ask if it was legit because it looked fake. This was their very last vigil flap, one per person uh, before the lodge merged. So, and they destroyed the... Uh, the ones that weren't issued prior to that. So if you see now, this could be easily faked, but if you see a computer designed rolled edge Tonkaku 487 flap, flap with a gauze back, there's a fair chance that it's their vigil flap. And it's, it's very rare. I actually got this from the very last lodge advisor of that lodge and it was his personal flap. And I certainly hope it doesn't get faked. And then we have a mystery sleeper. So the fall OA Campery in Sudbury, Mass. We don't know what year, but the construction would suggest 60s or 70s. Um, it was held in Sudbury, Mass, obviously. The town of Sudbury was within Algonquin Council, and its OA lodge was Tonkatu 487. But on the other hand, Knobscott scout reservation, which belonged to Norm Vega Council, that's also located in Sudbury. And they were home to uh, Muscatawquit 414. So to be honest, I have never seen positive provenance to attribute this to one of those two lodges. Those are the two likely candidates. Um, but I don't know for sure. So there's a, a mystery sleeper for you. If anyone ever hears or finds any information, you know, that allows us to attribute this to one lodge or the other, I would love, love to hear about it. So moving on to the lodge that formed from those two, we had Chip and Yonk 59. Chip and Yonk 59 had a pretty tough first issue because it was one per honor but then it got faked out of China and the fake was almost perfect and it killed the market. Um, I'm thinking that some future presentation should really focus on fakes and how to tell them apart. But for now, these I would consider for this lodge, the three sleepers because they're, they're the hardest ones to find. So the service team were, you know, again, a, a service committee. And then over here, they hosted the any one I conclave in 2005. And for the service staff, they made 75 with a silver mylar border, and they made 25 with a gold mylar border. And at this point, you know, it's more than 15 years ago, these things um, have just dried up, they vanished. So I, I do know several people that are in this area that are looking for uh, these issues in particular. Sleepers, um, and if you happen to find them elsewhere in the country, you know, you've got a, a market for them up here, people looking for them. And then Tantamus, this, um, the new lodge here, um, their first flap I think was pictured way up at the beginning of the presentation. 
they haven't been around long enough to really have sleepers, but I will say the flap that people seem to be having the most difficulty getting after the fact is their S2, which is this dark gray bordered flap that was apparently only available at one of their early work weekends. And so if you went and you worked and gave service, you were able to get this. And if you are now chasing and trying to find it, um, it's pretty tough to come by. Um, I don't know if this is a showstopper yet, but their Northeast region chief had a set of three for 2020. The gold mylar border one is the one that you had to get from the, uh, the region chief himself. There was also a red border and a gray border that the lodge uh, had sold to members. And then finally, this is perhaps their newest issue. I don't know if I'd call it a sleeper yet, but because it's their Alangamat flap, it certainly has a possibility of being a sleeper since um, so many of the other sleepers and other lodges tend to be Alangamat flaps. So moving on to Rhode Island, um, none of their flaps are terribly killer. It's um, a fairly easy lodge to collect. They had trading flaps where they changed the border every year. So they were kind of guaranteed to sell more. But these are pretty obscure. Um, a lot of people may not have seen them. The 69 was an ordeal patch, but the hardest law, uh, I'm sorry, the hardest patch from this entire lodge and you know, for the entire state of Rhode Island up until maybe 10, 15 years ago is this 10th anniversary fellowship patch. So if you're collecting Rhode Island, this is almost always the last one that you find. Um, though the 69 here is, is pretty obscure as well. So again, something to look for. And if you think, gee, fellowship patches aren't in demand or they're not worth anything, uh, with this one, you'd be wrong. And then we come to Abnaki Lodge 102, which was formed by Winchek and uh, Nemat. And they have a lot of sleepers. This is just a fraction of sleepers. But they have um, their Alangamat service patch. Again, it's earned uh, by a small number of people. So this was uh, pretty rare. Uh, they have a number of chapters. So you're taking the smallest state in the country and you're dividing it up into chapters. And this one here was for me uh, very difficult to get. They had black border chapter patches and then the yellow border chapter patches were for the chapter officers and advisors. And only 25 of this one, I believe were made. And then they have a vigil reunion every year. Uh, they did in Abnaki 102, and they continue to this day in Tulpi 102. And this particular year, they hadn't ordered a patch in advance. And so the, I believe it was the staff advisor, took this camp patch that they had a quantity of, and they took it to an embroidery factory, and they had this vigil arrow over sewn uh, or embroidered over these camp patches and they use these for their vigil uh, retreat that year. Um, very scarce because it was one per person and I believe only 30 or so were made. And then finally this one, they have um, following in the uh, footsteps of Aero Corps 2008 starting in 2009, they instituted a week long program at Camp Yagu and uh, for arrowmen to do service. And they called it Arrow Corps. Uh, 2009, the, the patch was very similar to a film on Arrowhead in design. And they've done it every year since, um, even, even to this day. This one um, is the rarest one. And there's a bit of controversy around this. They had 30 participants, they had 30 patches, and supposedly the bag of 30 patches got quote unquote, lost, uh, they disappeared. And so the council um, scrambled to get some replacements and they were able to kind of 
scrape up another 30 and they gave them to their participants. Again, one per person. Um, these don't get out much. It's actually my last remaining need in the entire state of Rhode Island. So um, I'm always on the lookout for this one. It's the bear on the shovel. And now looking north to the older Tulpe, there are, you know, again, there's the theme of, of small teams having um, issued sleepers. I did want to point out that they had a silver vigil pin. This dates to the 1960s. Um, it's not a Caldwell, but it's similar in style, use, and um, rarity. So um, I've seen two, maybe. Um, so they had this little vigil pin and it would pin actually in the center of their S1 flap that was their lodge flap in the uh, 1960s. And then their ceremonies team produced in fairly low quantity, this patch on the right. So again, that's a sleeper too, if you see it. And then these, um, these are three out of their five Alangamat program patches. They run a uh, very well-oiled uh, Alangamat program. Um, if you go and you work an ordeal once, you would get this first patch on the left. No lettering, no writing. You wouldn't know what it was if you didn't know what it was. And then you could go and you could serve as an Alangamat and earn the second one. And then the third one here was even later in the program. Um, I don't have all the details of, of how these were earned, but again, each one of these could be earned only once, no matter how many times you served. And there are two more in the series that I don't have, don't have and don't have pictures of. So, um, but they all feature this Native American in profile and they have other memorabilia. They have belt buckles, they have bolo ties, all of them incorporating this motif. So if you see that, it's likely tied to the Alangamat and Brotherhood programs of Tulpe Lodge 245. And then finally, this uh, Fall Fellowship patch on the right was another difficult one. What they did is uh, they would typically only make maybe 50 fellowship patches because they weren't a huge lodge. And this year they made 10 with a silver border for the staff. So again, with only 10 made, really hard to find. And now to the current Telpe Lodge 102. Um, <clears throat> which covers uh, all of Rhode Island, uh, most of Southeast Massachusetts and, and up. And again, I, I mentioned that they had these vigil reunions every year and the new lodge is continuing that tradition and they've issued some pretty interesting patches with historical significance. This, this 102 felt whale was obviously a, a tribute to the 509 felt whale um, they produced uh, a chenille here and another chenille here. These are both uh, vigil reunion patches. And then they did a felt on felt on felt patch here for an, another uh, more recent one. So any, any of the, the vigil patches here are um, made in pretty, pretty low numbers. So what else is out there? Um, I found this really interesting. This is a big mystery. So, and it covers southeastern Massachusetts. This is a um, manufacturer's brochure from the Eastern Emblem Company. Um, they made quality shiftly embroidered patches, made to order, no minimum. Um, and I have little red arrows here pointing to a couple that I know were made. So it appears Eastern Emblem made the 297F3 Uncas flap here. Um, they made a Kuiwanic flap here. I know this uh, 1963 Region 1 Trader Repatch was made because I have one. Um, and then there's this guy down here. And that's the mystery. 
because, uh, and this was dated 1964. So this is Eastern Emblems brooch, sales brochure for 1964. And it has a picture or drawing of an Ojibwa chapter, Lodge 393. And, you know, I don't know any active 393 members from 1964. Um, so I may be talking to the wrong people, but nobody that I've spoken to has ever heard of this. Um, they haven't heard of the chapter. They haven't seen the patch. But the fact that they have no minimum whatsoever and they gladly make you one patch really makes me wonder if there was such a chapter and whether they made as few as one patch. So this is a sleeper that might still be out there just waiting for someone to find. Um, I just wanted to throw it out there because you know, it could be there, it could be out there. And obviously there are other sleepers out there that, um, you know, we haven't discovered yet. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes the hobby interesting, particularly when you can find a 70 year old neckerchief in a, in a collection that comes in, or, um, you know, maybe a chapter patch um, that's almost 60 years old here. It, it could be out there. So there's a sleeper that I'm always looking for. And now you can look for it too. And so that's, um, that's the 15 lodges that I'm covering. I have a, a shameless plug for some of my needs. If you ever run across any of these, um, shoot me an email or, or an instant message or something. Uh, that's my last of Naki need. And uh, the blue border Muscatakwit or any of the red borders, um, if you run across any of those, uh, shoot, shoot me a, a message. Um, there's a good chance that I uh, would be interested. So thank you. Um, my next presentation in three weeks will be the East and Northeast Massachusetts. And there's a little teaser. I got a few questions for you. You included the X1. Um, you know, I, I personally don't have an X1 for 393, um, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't necessarily consider it a showstopper. I mean, as long as you got 300 bucks lying around, it's, they're pretty easy to come by. Um, in, in this economy, that's true. It used to be much more expensive. You know, at the peak, it was maybe a $900 piece. Oh, um, now the economy is such and values are such that, you know, you can pick things up for a fraction of what they used to sell for. But it's a Wabaningo issue. And that is a specialized, you know, subset that people collect um, aggressively. And, you know, it, it's still one you would need if you were trying to complete that set. Okay, because like I would personally, I would consider the X3 more, more rare. Like I've been collecting 393 for a decade now, and I've, I've never seen one. And I've been looking constantly. And same thing for the, the 1980 events, I mean, High Adventure, or uh, yeah, High Adventure Power Wow. I've, I've never, I've seen one, but so it 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 all depends on when you collect so you're you're a, a younger newer collector and you know i was collecting when those things were just everywhere Fair. <laughs> so you know what i mean so sometimes you just you you stumble onto something or you get something so easily that you don't respect it so i love your perspective that those are you know scarce nowadays and i'm going to go to my dupe bag after this and i i have some of those <laughs> well and what's interesting is uh at noax everything from new england was uh held hostage to everyone outside of new england so every issue was tough if you were trading at a noax <laughs> yeah i mean and i tried to avoid delegate issues um, in this presentation, just because some of them are, you know, so limited, but, you know, in a sense, perhaps contrived. Uh, the 86 jacket patch from Tisquantum was the exception. I don't think it was, I mean, it, it could be that the contingent just didn't buy a lot because they were expensive, but, um, you know, that's, that's the key piece for that lodge. <laughs> 